Late at night, an absent-minded driver, call him Dave, is trying to make his way home with just a map. Unfortunately, while Dave knows what the overall structure of the road is ahead of him, the foolish architects made the intersections completely identical. Even worse, Dave is so tired that he won't actually be able to remember whether he's passed an intersection or not. The only consolation is that Dave's map has predefined utilities for each path. If he takes the exit at intersection X, the map states that there is also a huge cliff that will certainly be his demise, giving him zero utility. The map also says that if he keeps going and then takes the exit on intersection Y, he'll find his way back home, giving him four utility. However, if he continues past intersection Y, he'll be even more delayed as he's missed his chance to get home, which gives him one utility. A little better than a guaranteed drive off a cliff, but not by much. So what should Dave do? The idea of this problem originates from the 1997 paper on the interpretation of decision problems problems with imperfect recall by Pignone and Rubinstein. However, the variation I'm working with here is from the later paper where this puzzle gets its name, The Absent-Minded Driver by Alman, Hart, and Perry. Both papers will be linked in the description. For a more formal description of the problem, we can read the abstract itself. An absent-minded driver starts driving at start from the picture shown on the screen. At X, he can either exit and get to A for a payoff of 0, or continue to Y. At Y, he can either exit and get to B, which is payoff 4, or continue to C, which is payoff 1. The essential assumption is that he cannot distinguish between intersections X and Y, and cannot remember whether he's already gone through one of them. Given these conditions, how can the driver maximize his utility? From a naive perspective, Dave should obviously never exit 100% of the time at an intersection, since he's guaranteed to always drive off a cliff in that scenario. However, if he goes straight through, he'll never get home and will never reap the benefits of that sweet plus 4 utility at the end of B. So logically, the optimal move should be some probability in between. Let P be the probability of proceeding through and not taking the exit. We can now use the law of total expectation, which states that the expected value of a random variable A can be found by summing the expectation of A given some subscenario weighted by the probability of each exclusive subscenario occurring. Here, we're conditioning where Dave ends up. For example, he has a P squared chance of going all the way through through, in which case he gets plus 1 utility. Furthermore, he has a p times 1 minus p chance of exiting at the second intersection, in which case he gets plus 4 utility. Lastly, he gets no utility for turning immediately, which zeroes out the expected value he gets for conditioning on that subscenario. Mathematically, let x be the random variable representing the expected amount of utility Dave will get. Then our expected value is e of x equals 1 times p squared plus 4 times 1 minus p times p plus 0 times p, which is just equal to 4p minus 3p squared. Since this is a function of p that is represented by a concave down polynomial, we can use the first derivative test to maximize this. Taking the derivative of the expression with respect to p and setting it to 0, we get 4 minus 6p equals 0, or p equals 2 thirds. This gets an expected utility of 4 times 2 thirds minus 3 times 2 thirds squared, which is equal to 4 thirds. In other words, before Dave will ever reach the segment of the road, he should already plan to turn with probability 2 thirds at any intersection he's at. I know some of you in the comments might say, wait a minute, if Dave was really absent-minded, wouldn't he not remember to do this as a prior? For those people, my answer is just, please bear with me for the sake of the problem here. It's a really cool thought experiment meant to test the fundamental interpretation of probability. We're looking for a deep understanding here rather than winning off a technicality like a riddle. Anyway, this strategy of always turning with probability 2 thirds is what Alman, Hart, and Perry call planning optimal, where we create some strategy known prior to ever encountering an intersection to begin with. For the sake of problem continuity, maybe Dave had this value written down on his map. For anyone confused on how you could generate a probability of exactly two-thirds, you can check out my second video, where I talk about how to turn any coin fair or not into a controlled precise probability. Now, back to those commenters I just addressed, this is your time to shine. Let's pretend we're in Dave's shoes. We've pulled up to some intersection and we have no idea whether it's the first or the second. However, we do realize that we're actually at an intersection, presumably by seeing a fork in the road. That begs the question, shouldn't we optimize for the fact that this could be either intersection? Does the fact that we're actually at an intersection give us some information? This is the question that original authors Pignoni and Rubinstein originally asked. If we ascribe some value, say alpha, which represents the probability that we're currently at intersection x, then the math gets interesting. Now, using the law of total expectation again, we're conditioning on the possibility that we're either at intersection x or not at intersection x, i.e. intersection y. Then the math becomes e of x equals alpha times, all in parentheses, 1 times p squared plus 4 times 1 minus p times p plus 0 times p, parentheses, plus, and then 1 minus alpha times, all in parentheses, 4 times 1 minus p 
plus 1 times p. Note that in the last expression, 4 times 1 minus p plus 1 times p has a different probability weighting since that is the case where we're considering the possibility that we're not at intersection x, i.e. we're at intersection y. This process is known as being action optimal, as opposed to our previous case of being planning optimal. But wait a minute, we don't even have to do any math here yet. It's obvious from a first glance that any value of alpha besides alpha equals 1 inherently will give us a different expected utility function since we're including new variables, meaning the results of the first derivative test will also be different, and hence, Dave's decision-making process at the intersection will also be different. However, alpha equals 1 implies that Dave knows with 100% certainty that he's at intersection x, which contradicts the idea that he's absent-minded and can't tell which intersection he's at. This presents what seems to be a paradox. How can Dave's in-the-moment decision-making process change from his original planning optimal approach if all he does is pull up to an intersection without actually knowing what intersection he's at? Many people, including Pignoni and Rubenstein, said that we should account for the possibility of being at both intersections, which seems like a reasonable thing to do at first. After all, we're guaranteed to at least run across the first intersection, and we have a p probability of seeing the second. As a result, they said that alpha should equal the relative weight of the probabilities, or 1 over 1 plus p. Doing the math, this means e of x equals 1 over 1 plus p times, in parentheses, 4p minus 3p squared plus p over 1 plus p times, all in parentheses, 4 minus 3p, which is just equal to 2p times 4 minus 3p all over 1 plus p. Using the first derivative test, we set 14 over p plus 1 squared minus 6 equals 0. So our optimal value is square root of 7 over 3 minus 1, which is about 0.52. In this formulation, using p equals 0.52 gets an expected value of around 1.67. But before we get too excited at this roughly 25% increase in expected value, we should take a step back. From our planning optimal representation of expected value, our expected utility before ever seeing any intersection should still be 4p minus 3p squared, meaning if we plug in around p equals 0.52, we get around 1.27 for our expected utility. So to really clarify things here, this is what we have. From a planning optimal perspective, Dave would declare that he's going to proceed with probability two-thirds at any intersection before he ever sees any intersection to begin with. This strategy yields an expected utility of 1.33. From an action optimal perspective, once Dave gets to an intersection, he'd think it's better for him to condition on actually being at an intersection, which we saw would mean he'd conclude to proceed with probability 0.52, which gets an expected value of 1.67, better than a planning optimal perspective. But if we combine the two plans and decided to use even further foresight to predict the fact that Dave is guaranteed to be at an intersection just not remembering which one he's at, then using a prior probability of 0.52 gets an expected value of 1.27, which is lower than what we had in the initial case. In other words, it appears that not planning ahead initially gets the best result, but the inherent act of planning to not plan ahead gets the worst result. So how on earth do we resolve this? After all, surely it makes some sense to accept the idea that we'll always be at some intersection. Well, just because Dave can look around and find himself at an intersection doesn't mean he actually garners any information on a probabilistic basis. All he knows is that he's quote unquote here, but what does here actually mean? There's no legitimate way to form a probability distribution over where exactly is here from a purely subjective standpoint. The 1.67 value arises because Dave would be saying, conditional on the event that I am at the intersection, there's a 1 over 1 plus p chance that it's x, and p over 1 plus p chance that it's y. This entire concept is invalid, because it presupposes the idea that a Bayesian update about which place Dave might be at among multiple identical places is possible. Remember, the rules explicitly state that Dave has no recollection of whether he's passed an intersection or not, and cannot tell the difference between x and y. Thus, the maths for 1.67 actually overcounts and leaves out the world where Dave would have exited earlier, where then he would currently not be in an intersection. This means that even though Dave will always find himself at an intersection in theory, the action stage mindset is inherently invalid. There's no new information in the moment that legitimately changes his plan. Therefore, there is only one vantage point that matters, the ex ante, or the planning optimal solution. Dave gains no information when he arrives anywhere, because here is not a piece of Bayesian evidence that changes anything. The coolest part about this problem, I think, is how it challenges typical game theory assumptions. In most problems, it's valid to treat possible outcomes almost as different players. For instance, without the absent-minded clause, we could suppose that Dave X and Dave Dave Y were two different players who had different strategies based on their locations. These locations might have their own equilibriums too. Here, it's always better to proceed at X and turn at Y. In this 
puzzle though, Dave X and Dave Y are not really two separate people who can communicate. They are the same single agent with no memory or distinguishing features for any intersection. Once Dave forgets whether he's at X or Y, he can't meaningfully choose a new equilibrium just for the second intersection. This type of puzzle is called an anthropic puzzle, one that refers to self-locating beliefs, that is, beliefs about where or when you, as an observer, find yourself within a broader setup. Another classic anthropic puzzle is the Sleeping Beauty problem. I'll link a fantastic video by Veritasium in the description to see if you can figure out in the comments if this video and approach supports the halfers or the thirders positions that he discusses. Granted, the assumptions stated in this video are pretty unrealistic in real life. Usually, a Bayesian probabilistic approach on updating your priors is a pretty safe way to live life. This video was just meant to be a thought experiment on when conditioning within the moment actually derives a worse outcome. In the real world, we don't actually have to account for this observer effect, but it's pretty cool to see such a stark example where it matters. If you strongly disagree with anything presented in the video, please let me know in the comments. I'm always looking for feedback on how to improve. Also, thanks for watching the video. I'm absolutely blown away by the amount of attention everyone's been giving. Somehow, at least 1,000 of you think that my videos are worth tuning into enough to subscribe, and I really appreciate that. Sorry about the delays from the video uploads. For the future, I think I'll try to upload around once every two weeks. As usual, all sources will be linked in the description. If you're new and find my content interesting, please subscribe. With winter break ending, it'll be harder to make videos, but I'll keep trying my best. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you next time.